a pleasant and beautiful Sunday morning greetings coming to you. Thank you for tuning in again this morning and you're welcome to join me again once in a, again in another Sunday school session. It's my privilege to greet you in the name of the Lord and I trust that as we study another beautiful lesson that everyone will be blessed as we study the Word of God. Thank you again for tuning in this morning and may God bless us as we study together. Uh, we have two more lessons uh, in our quarter to complete this quarterly and um, today's lesson is on the subject of perfecting holiness, perfecting holiness. And next Sunday, we're going to be studying on the hope of the sanctified. As you will remember, we are studying on sanctification and we've had some very lovely lessons uh, on this subject. And today we are going to be studying on perfecting holiness under the subject of sanctification. So it's my pleasure greeting you again this morning. Thank you for tuning in and I trust you all had a beautiful week and may God bless us now as we study his word. Let's have a word of prayer, please. Our Father in heaven again this morning, we thank you for your goodness unto us, your love that is shown to us daily. We thank you, dear Lord, for blessing us with another night's rest and bringing us into this another beautiful morning. We thank you for the beauty of nature, dear Lord, as we look around on the outside, dear Lord, we see how wonderful it is, dear Lord, that you have created this beautiful world, dear Lord, and has placed us here to enjoy it. Help us, dear Lord, to take the time to um, observe and to appreciate and to worship you, dear Lord, because of your greatness and the, the, the love that you have shown to us. Now, Lord, I pray that you will take this lesson as we study it. May it be um, understood. May I be able to impart, dear Lord, in the way that you would have me to do so this morning. And may each heart, dear Lord, and each one that is listening, receive uh, a blessing from your word this day. So we give you thanks and ask your guidance and your leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. So, perfecting holiness. And perfecting means to be developing or to evolve, for something to be evolving, right? It is constantly changing and developing into something better or different. So that's what we're looking at here this morning under the subject of perfecting holiness, not saying that we are at the peak of our holiness, but we are working on it. And it's a development. It's an evolving um, situation as we exercise our faith, as we understand the Word of God, and as we bring ourselves under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and His Word. We are perfecting our holiness. Um, there's a scripture that is in Peter, I think Peter 1 and 3, I think it was First Peter 1 and 3. I could be wrong there, but it's in Peter. And it said, be, be ye holy as I am holy. And um, that's a, a tall order there if we are going to be holy as God is holy. But what God is, is asking us to do is to perfecting our holiness. Try your best to enhance your, your life, your spiritual walk in a holy way, right? He understands. He knows our weaknesses. He knows what is um, 
our struggles are. But he's encouraging us to be holy as he is holy, right? Seek after being like him. Now, the, the member verse of our lesson reads as follows. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's found in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, those promises that were before this, this verse um, 7, he's saying, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So God is asking us to rid ourselves of that which is not godly. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And when we endeavor to, to do that, then we are perfecting our holiness. Like he says here, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we have a responsibility, always have a responsibility uh, to do our part. And what he is, what Paul is saying here to these brethren is to get rid of those fleshly and spiritual filthiness or unholiness or sinful um, conditions. And when we find ourselves walking and moving away from these um, fleshly and uh, spiritual filthiness of the flesh, as, as he has put it there, we will be perfecting our holiness. In other words, like I said, we will be developing in our holy walk towards God. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The introduction reads, Man is held accountable only for the things that he knows. Since he can be more fruitful in the use of more knowledge of God's righteousness, God endeavors to lead him continually into a better understanding of his word, and he will. Right? So, we are accountable for the things that we understand. But God knows that we are capable of understanding more. So, he is going to work with us. Okay? He's going to work with us. He's going to guide us along the way. If we keep ourselves where we are to be, close to his side, in his word, you know, having a good relationship with him, he is going to guide us and lead us into more knowledge. Right? It's uh, like uh, a baby that is newborn. That baby receives its mother's milk and or maybe some formula of milk. Then from there, you know, it develops into maybe a cereal type of feed, something a little harder, stronger, something that will hold the child's um, satisfaction for a, a longer time and will help it develop, develop in other ways too. So it's that way God works with us too. As newborn babes in Christ, he understands that it's going to take time, it's going to take some nurturing for us to understand um, the, the, the fullness of his, his way. So it's going to guide us and lead us along. But we have to make ourselves available for him to do that with us and for us. So the memory verse again saying, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, we have this obligation, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness 
of the flesh and spirit. And by doing that, we are perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Uh, today we may be doing everything we know to do and walking in all the light we have. This is a Christian perfection from man's standpoint. Yet from God's side, he can see much that needs improvement in the lives of all of us. Thus, the process of perfecting holiness shall go on in our lives as long as we live. So we don't get to know it all and we level off, right? No, as long as we live and we are engaged in a fellowship with God, there is going to be things that we are going to learn and things that we are going to understand in deeper um, understanding as the light is imparted to us and we receive by the Holy Spirit the, the understanding of the Word of God. Okay? And it says, take for example, one who um, in despair seeks deliverance in Christ and finds it. As he starts the Christian race, he will live in a lower state of holiness in the sight of God than the soldier of the cross who has successfully fought the good fight of faith for many years. Yet, he, the one who just started, is much saved as the older Christian is. So not because you are not spiritual and mature uh, coming in as the person you might have found in that was there for a long time. That doesn't say that you are not a child of God. You are still a child of God but you are a babe in, 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 in the sense of infancy in the work of God. So it's going to take some time for you to develop your learning, your understanding of the Word of God, of the will of God, what to take off and what to put on, etc. Okay? So that's how you perfecting your holiness. Uh, that your day okay I think that's enough on that subject there now let's look at uh, the scriptures and I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 6 14 down to verse 18 and listen carefully how these um, words are put together how these scriptures are put together this is not my words, it is the Bible. And it says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion, what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Baal? Be, 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 or what part had he that believe it with an infidel? Excuse me there. And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Now listen carefully, the wordings here and how it compares us with God as being not of God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Who are these people? The Christians, the believers, right? Those are who God is speaking of here. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate 
said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. So here we see that God has a separate walk and a separate call for his chosen people. And in that separation, there is a difference from what you're being separated from. And this should not be hard to understand. I, don't, I do not understand why some people will think that God is such a, a lovely, lovely God that he doesn't see wrong or he doesn't have a standard whereby we are to be held to. Yes, God is love and he understands. But we have to understand too that there is a standard by which he governs and we have to come in line with his governance and not him come in line with our desires. Okay? Because what we find is that many times we want to do things in our way, in our thinking, in our reasoning, right? And still expect God to accept it and bless us. No. It does not work that way. God has a standard and he wants us to live by his standard and not our standard. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, he says here. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, for those of you who are in the Caribbean that might be listening to me now, it's daylight for us. The sun is up and it took over the ruling of the day. So the moonlight was there last night. I think it was still there. I really didn't witness it last night because I was in early. But darkness was there last night, but now it is day. So the darkness has been put aside and the day is taking uh, control. So, and the light that governs the day, the sun, is in control of what is now present. So it says here, what communion at light with darkness? There is no communion. When the sun comes up, it dispels the darkness and the night is gone. So when Christ comes into our lives as Savior and Lord of our lives, the sinful things that we used to do, the dark things that we used to do, God's light through Jesus Christ is now shining on us and therefore we are dispelling that darkness and the light is taking over. So there is no fellowship with light and darkness. And what concord at Christ with Baal or what part at he that believeth with an infidel? And we know who an infidel is, is one who have no belief or believe that belief in that there is a God. And we are not to fellowship with such people in their belief. Okay? We need to love them, yes, because they are human beings. They have a soul that needs correction if they're an infidel. And by you living out a Christian life in front of them, you and I might shed some light on them to turn from their, 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 their darkness of being an infidel and turning onto the righteousness of God. So we have a responsibility to walk 
in the light. And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Each one of us who is born by the Holy Spirit and living in the will of God, we are God's temple. He says that he will abide with us, abide and dwell in us. Okay? So, we, and in God's temple, there are no idols. So, if we have had some idols in our lives before we were redeemed, those idols need to be put aside. Okay? They have to be laid, laid aside. So what agreement at the temple with God, of God with idols? For ye are the temple, we now redeemed, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, meaning the redeemed, the Christian. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So you see, there is a separate walk with God. We cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. The Bible tells us that because it's going to cause confusion. It's going to cause us to be unhappy and unsettled in our, uh, our, our, our way of walk and trying to please because you're going to want to please God, but at the same time, you're going to want to do what Satan tells you to do too. So it's always going to be that struggle. So we have to cut loose, leave the idols out, and be the temple that God wants to, to dwell in and walk in and walk with him in this separate walk that he has called us to walk in. Because it says, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Like I said, speaking of the redeemed. Verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. How much clearer can we have it? God wants us to walk the separate walk. From the beginning of creation, God has set that rule in place. That we, as his children of righteousness, we walk a separate walk from the world. We walk a separate walk from the unredeemed. We are to not to fellowship the work of darkness. We are to fellowship only God by worshiping Him in truth, in, in truth and holiness and in the light. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So if we want to be received of God, have God's approval on us, we need to move away from sinful things and continue to walk in the will of God. Remember we're speaking or we're studying on perfecting holiness, walking, developing in our holiness on, with God. And he says in verse 18, And I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters said the lord almighty i shall be what a father and those of us who have had fathers that were in your lives you know the importance of that how you look to your father for certain things, for protection, for monetary um, assistance, for leadership in the in the family, 
a father's role is very important in in the lives of um, of children or offsprings and those who are absent from that is not doing the will of God but God said if you move away from unrighteousness and follow after righteousness I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters right true through the adoption of righteousness through the blood of Christ, bringing us in to be heirs and joint heirs with Christ. He said, you shall be sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Thank the Lord for that privilege. We all have that privilege, but it's for you to accept the offer that is given to you. Second Corinthians, no, we dealt with that as the member verse. Now, first John 2 6 says, He has said, He abided, he that said, He abide in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. I read that again. He that said, He abided in him, if we say we are Christians, if we say we are Christ, um, we, we ought also to walk even as Christ walked. And how did Christ walk? He walked in the will of his Father. He walked in righteousness. He always sought his Father's direction. Even going to the cross, when he faced the, the weight of the world, the sins of the world, from the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, to, to, until the last person who is going to be alive in this world, Christ took on that burden of sin for us. And when he was facing to go to the cross, to be that sacrificial lamb, the final lamb that is going to be slain for the redemption of our sins. He felt the weight of that. And what did he say? Father, is there another way out? And he prayed about this several times. And when he didn't get the answer that he probably was looking for he went back and he submitted he said if there is not a way out lord let your will be done so that's how we have to live in the will of god he that said he abided in him ought also himself to walk even as he walked christ walked in the will of god so we have to learn to walk in the will of god perfecting our holiness in the will of God, or through the will of God. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Even thereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So, did Christ suffer? Yes, he did. Did he was he persecuted? Yes, he did. Was he mocked? Yes, he did. Was he spoken um, harshly against and despised? Yes, he did. So when we as Christian are facing the mockery of the world and the dislike of our peers or those that don't want to have anything to do with us, or even your church brother and sister um, speak something or say something that doesn't make you feel good. This is all expected, right? Because he tells us here in scripture, um, for even there unto where he called, because Christ also 
suffered for us. So when we are going through our little tests and our temptation and persecution, remember, Christ suffered for us. And if we are going to be Christ-like, we have to go through some sufferings too. It's not a rosy bed of road, uh, uh, of a bed of roses that is presented to us. It comes with some thorns in those roses too, all right? It might be beautiful, but at times there are some thorns or some prickles might be there that might stick us, okay? And it goes on to say that, um, so he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. So we should follow in the steps of Christ. Okay? And verse 22 goes on to say, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So Christ set for us a perfect example of how we should live and how we should desire to perfect our holiness. Right? We're the subject of our lesson, perfecting holiness, or in other words, developing into holiness, right? Or developing our holiness, or evolving in our holy walk with God. So Christ who, Christ who did no sin, neither was guile found in his bout. Who, when he was reviled, listen to this, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but commit himself to him that judgeth, judgeth righteously. And who was that? His father, right? When he had a problem, he didn't take it out on the people that was giving him the problem, but he left that to his father, right? Judgment. Vengeance belongs to God. He will take care of the situation. Facing unjust treatment, the devil will heap upon the Christian much injustice, using his fellow men as agents to this end. A Christian cannot reach the devil by striking back at the agent he has used. It is in the hands of God to repay. So remember, let God do the repay. So we are not to strike back at all, for this is the example that Christ has given. And one of my scriptures that keep me intact is draw nigh to Christ, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So when you are going through these persecution, these temptations, these um, sufferings that we might, might call it, some of them can be so trivial that we call problems and suffering, but whatever, however you, you, you condition them, right? Remember, to, to, to make yourself a, vic a victor over this, draw near to God. Get to God's side, okay? And when you are close to him, then you can dispel Satan. You can resist him because you are protected. You're under the wings of God. You're under the arms of God. But if you're going out there on a limb on your own or in your own power, you are going to succumb, okay? So perfecting our holiness by submitting unto God and his will. It is Satan's and the people who have his nature, who fight against the teaching of holiness. The devil is trying his best to make the world believe that his, unri that his unrighteous and wicked ways are the best and much to be desired and will give the greatest pleasure in the end. But anyone who will let himself think can see that Satan is entirely wrong and that Following his ways leads to misery, sorrow, pain, woe, and death. Millions are believing his lies. 
forfeiting their right to the tree of life. It is our duty to tell the truth and to lead men into the experience of holiness. So that's my job, to tell you the truth, to help you understand what the scripture says and your responsibility is to accept the word of God. Do as it instructs you to do and you will find yourself developing, evolving in your perfection of holiness. May God bless you. Do your best this week to stay on top of your situation. May God give you the desire of your heart and seek his face and he will be there with you. God bless you. Father in heaven, we take this lesson dear Lord. Let it be a source of comfort and strength and enlightenment to the hearers, dear Lord. And pray, dear Lord, that you will bless it as they, they receive it and accept it, dear Lord, that it will help them in their Christian walk and that your will will be done through them. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next Sunday if life spare. And the subject of our lesson for next Sunday is the hope of the sanctified. God bless you. Have a great week.